Hi, I'm Pete Duncanson, Media Arts Pastor, and I'd like to take a moment to say thank you for being here. If you are physically here with us today, please be aware that for your safety, we are practicing social distancing and ask you to respect those that are using precautions as well. If you'd like to know more about what is going on right here at Central, whether upcoming events or just learning about who we are, check us out on the web, Facebook, and yes, we even have an app for that. If the ministry at Central has blessed you and you would like to give, you can do that multiple ways. By using the physical boxes located in the back by the sound booth, through online giving, or even through our app. Thanks again for joining us today, and God bless. We are uh, thrilled. He is an ordained minister in the Assemblies of God. He's one of us, and well, his lovely wife is as well. They are ones of us. We're delighted they're here today. I'll let him introduce her. Pastor James, why don't you come this morning and bless us in the Word of God. Welcome home, brother. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. My wife is here with me, and uh, our beautiful little girl, her name is Julieta Lorraine Espido, and she is the most beautiful baby that I have ever seen, and that is my completely unbiased opinion right there. Um, she is just a little angel, and we love her absolutely and completely to death. Um, but it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning, isn't it, church? The last year and a half has taught me anything. It's taught me that it's good to be among God's people. It's good to be among God's people. Let's not take that for granted. Let's not take that for granted anymore that we get to gather together to be with one another, to encourage one another, exhort, lift each other up. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord with God's people today. Uh, I was reading a book that had this story in it, and um, in August of 1888, this story was run in the Columbia Chess Chronicle about champion chess player Paul Morphy. The story took place 20 years before it was actually published and put in writing, and the story was about how Paul Morphy was invited to dinner among the social elite in Richmond, Virginia. He was invited there um, to just have dinner and to play some chess. But while he was there, something caught his attention, something that was there. Uh, they're going to put up the picture of this painting is what caught his attention attention. Here, here's the painting that was hanging on the wall. It caught his attention and it caught his interest. The painting is titled Checkmate. Let me read to you the description of it that was printed in the Chess Chronicle. It says, the devil is playing a game of chess with a young man for his soul. In bad case indeed is the unhappy youth, for his game as represented appears not only desperate but hopeless and his fate sealed. His adversary gloats in anticipation of the final coup and the gleaming smile on the face of the latter intensifies the despair which that of the young man shows. This morning I want to talk to you from the topic checkmate. If you guys could just leave that picture up just a little bit longer. Checkmate. Anybody in here a fan of chess or an avid chess player in the room? Okay, a couple of us. How about um, people who like a game a little bit more my speed, checkers? <laughs> Any, anybody like? Okay, checkers is a little bit more my speed, but I know a little bit about the game of chess. I know enough to at least know what the term checkmate means. Checkmate is what you say when the game is over. When it's done, you see, the goal of the game of chess is to corner your opponent's king so that the king has no more moves. And as soon as the king has no more moves, you say checkmate because the game is over. If your king has no more moves, it's checkmate. It's game over. Sometimes in life, I think we find ourselves in the situation of that young man looking at an impossible situation. 
And I've arranged this chessboard up here to mirror the painting. And so this morning, if you'd like, after service, if you just want to come up and take a look at it, because I know it's hard to see where you are. But sometimes in life, we're faced with impossible situations. Sometimes in life, we're faced with that diagnosis. We're faced with that unexpected bill that comes out of nowhere that just blows up our budget. We're faced with a layoff, a job loss. We're faced with the loss of a family member. We're faced with marital issues. We're faced with financial difficulties. We're faced with issues in this life. And sometimes we feel like the young man. We feel like the enemy of our soul, the accuser of the brethren, Satan is about to say checkmate to us. The story in the Chess Chronicle continues this way. It says, With the close of supper, deeply interested, Morphy approached the picture and he studied it a while intently. Then turning to his host, he said modestly, I think I can take the young man's game and win. Why, impossible was the answer. Not even you, Mr. Morphy, can retrieve that game. Yet I think I can, said Morphy. Suppose we place the men and try. So a board was arranged and the rest of the company gathered round it, deeply interested in the result. To the surprise of everyone, victory was snatched from the devil and the young man saved. Thinking that a blunder must have led to this unexpected result, one after another did each sober, serious gentleman essay the devil's part, and to each in turn did Mr. Morphy prove that not even on intellectual grounds could the enemy be defended, for Morphy beat them one and all. What I love about this story is that it shows that victory can be snatched from the jaws of defeat. As long as... The king has one more move. As long as the king has one more move, you're not defeated. As long as the king has one more move, that diagnosis from the doctor doesn't have to mean checkmate. As long as the king has one more move, that bill doesn't have to destroy you. As long as the king has one more move, that lost loved one, that son, that daughter that's wayward, you are not defeated. Because the king has one more move. The king has one more move. Come on, church. Our king always has one more move. Our king, all, Pastor Tom, you got that diagnosis, but the king had one more move. The king had one more move. The enemy thought he had you in checkmate, but the king had one more move. Church, 20 plus years ago, a mother came in these doors with her two sons. That was my mother and me and my brother. And the enemy thought he had us in checkmate. See, my mother had just left my father because he had left the church. We were. <clears throat> we were a broken family. Broken mess. But the king had one more move. We walked in the doors of this church and we found a family. <laughs> I'm so thankful for you. I'm so thankful for a church that loves broken people, that ministers to broken people. I'm thankful for a church that cares about kids, that cares about students, that loves people. <laughs> because the king had one more move in my life. And I don't know what you carried to church with you this Sunday morning. I don't know what impossible situation. I don't know what desperate task. I don't know what you're going through. But the king knows exactly what you're going through. And you don't give up. Because the king has one more 
move. Today I want to show you from Scripture someone who the enemy thought he had in checkmate. If you have your Bibles with you, you can open them up with me to Second Chronicles chapter 20. That's where we're going to be this morning. If you have phone with an app, you can scroll there. Some of you are turning, some of you are scrolling, that's all right. We'll get to the same place as you do. Let me give you a little context for what's happening in our story. Jehoshaphat is the king of Judah. It's the ninth century BC. This is about a hundred years after Israel had split into the northern and southern kingdom under Rehoboam. And it's about a uh, hundred years before the nation of the northern kingdom of Israel would be um, destroyed by the Assyrians. It's about 300 years before the kingdom of Judah would be invaded in, by the Babylonians and Jerusalem and the temple would be destroyed and the people carried off into exile. This is the time frame that we have. King Jehoshaphat reigned at the same time as King Ahab in the north of Israel. We know that King Ahab was a wicked king. But King Jehoshaphat was a king who issued reform in Judah, and he was a king who loved and served the Lord. Second Chronicles 17, 3 through 4 says that the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he followed the ways of his father David before him. He did not consult the Baals, but sought the God of his father and followed his commands rather than the practices of Israel. Jehoshaphat was a good king, and he followed the Lord. But in Second Chronicles chapter 20, we find that he's in a bit of a bind. How many of you know that sometimes when you're following Jesus, bad things can still happen? Sometimes when you're following Jesus, that doesn't mean that difficulty doesn't arise. That doesn't mean that painful situations don't come. Second Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 1 says, After this, the Moabites and Ammonites with some of the Menuhites came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. How many of you know three against one really isn't fair? Three kingdoms created a coalition against Judah, and they were going to war against Jehoshaphat and the people of God in Judah. This is not a good situation. This is not a first world problem. At worst, they're looking at total destruction, all of them killed. At best, they're looking at a lifetime of slavery. The circumstances were dire. Second Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 3 says, Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. He proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. Jehoshaphat was alarmed. Now, in the Hebrew, the word that's translated alarmed means alarmed. <laughs> he was terrified. This is a difficult situation. He was alarmed. But notice what Jehoshaphat does when he is alarmed. Notice what he does when the difficult situation arises. He resolved to inquire upon the Lord. He called the entire nation of Judah to a time of fasting and prayer. And people from all of the cities of Judah gathered together in the capital city of Jerusalem and they fasted and they prayed because Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire on the Lord. This was his first instinct. His first instinct was to go to the Lord. What's our first instinct? What's your first instinct when difficulty arises? What's your first instinct when a trial comes, when a painful situation, when life just seems unfair? What's your first instinct? Is it to go to the phone or to go to the throne? Where do you go? Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire on the Lord. He didn't just inquire of the Lord. He was resolute in his inquiry. He resolved to inquire on the Lord. As we continue reading through 2 Chronicles 20, we see that people from every town in Judah gathered together. They fasted and they prayed and they sought the Lord. And at this gathering, Jehoshaphat stands up in front of them and he publicly prays a prayer that goes from verses 6 through 12. I'm not going to read all of that this morning, but I just want to focus on the very last verse. Second Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 20 says this. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power 
to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do. But our eyes are on you. We do not know what to do. But our eyes are fixed. The author and the perfecter of our faith. We do not know what to do. But we're holding on. We don't know what to do. But we're changing our perspective off of our problems and onto the king who always has one more move. Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire on the Lord and his prayer is, we don't know what to do, but Lord, our eyes are fixed on you. He says, we have no power over this situation. You know, the more that I grow up, the more of life I experience, the more I realize that there's so much of life that is just out of our control. So much of it is just out of our control. And if you're a control freak like I am, then that's a difficult pill to swallow knowing that there's just so much outside of our control. That's what Jehoshaphat's saying here. He's saying, this is all out of our control. Lord, we made these reforms. We started serving you. We're worshiping you. How could you let this happen? What is happening? Has your expectations not been met in your life? Has that ever happened to you before? You thought life would go a certain way. Maybe you thought you'd be married by now. Maybe you thought that this would happen. You thought you'd have this much money in the bank by now. You thought you'd have this much in retirement. You you didn't think that this would happen, but all of a sudden a curveball came. And your expectations were just blown away because of something that was outside of your control. That's what Jehoshaphat is experiencing here. He says, we have no power to defeat this enemy. It's totally out of our control. But our eyes are fixed on you. Most things we're powerless to change, but what we can do is do our best with what's under our control and leave the rest up to God. That's what Jehoshaphat's saying here. He's saying, I'm in a terrible situation. I have no power. I have no control, no clue what to do, but I trust you and I look to you. He acts on the words of the psalmist in Psalm 121 verses 1 and 2, which says, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. When the situation seems hopeless, where do your eyes go? See, I think hopelessness is a result of perspective. Holocaust survivor Viktor Frankl writes this. He says, when we're no longer able to change a situation, we're challenged to change ourselves. When we're no longer able to change a situation, we're challenged to change ourselves. Jehoshaphat couldn't change his position, but he could change his perspective. He said, I'm done focusing on what I can see. Because I can't control what I can see, but what I can do is I can lift my eyes upward to the king who has one more move. He resolved to stop focusing on the enormity of his difficulty and he started focusing on the immensity of his deity. It was a change in perspective. When you can't change your position and it's outside of your control, let me challenge you to change your perspective. Shift your eyes from your problems and onto the purposes that God has for your life. Change your perspective. When it looked like the enemy had Jehoshaphat in checkmate, he looked to the king who had one more move. After Jehoshaphat prayed, God sent an answer. Second Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 15 says this. It says, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army for the battle is not yours but God's. See, when we try to take the situation under our own control, what we do is we fight the battle in our own strength. But what Jehoshaphat did was he said, I can't do it. It's out of my control. So I'm surrendering that. I'm giving it to you. I'm changing my perspective. I'm looking up to you and I'm giving it to you. And when he did that, that act of surrender, 
He said, God, fight this battle for me. And God said, I will fight this battle for you. God fights for us when we're willing to surrender that control. Second Chronicles 20 verses 22 through 25 says the results. The Lord set ambushes against the men of Amnon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. The Ammonites, the Moabites, rose up against the men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. So they're turning on each other. And after they finished slaughtering the men from Seir, they helped destroy one another. When the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked toward the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. So Jehoshaphat and his men went to carry off their plunder, and they found among them a great amount of equipment and clothing and also articles of value, more than they could take away. There was so much plunder that it took three days to collect it. Isn't that just like our God? Isn't that just like our God? He turns an impossible situation into three days worth of plunder. Three, can, can you imagine Three days it's taking them to carry off all of the plunder that the enemy had left. And they didn't even need to pick up a sword. Because the king had one more move. The king always has one more move. Jehoshaphat faced defeat, but he turned to the king of kings who had one more move. You know, the more that I think about it, the more that I realize that life is actually a lot like the game of chess. It's a lot like the game of chess. And uh, how many of you know the term check when you're playing chess? Not checkmate, but the term check. Okay, a few of us. Um, so, again, more my speed is the game of Uno, right? Uno? Anybody? Anybody know Uno? We know Uno a little bit more than we know chess? Okay, it's good. We're on the same page then. Okay. Uno. So when we're playing Uno and somebody at the table says, Uno, that means what? What does it mean? One more card, right? They've got one more card left. That means that if you don't do something to counter what's happening, they are about to win the game, right? The same is true in the game of chess, only it's called check. It's called check. When the king is one move away from being taken, the opponent says, check. And so I want to talk to you this morning about three things, three things that we can do when the enemy has us in check. When the enemy has us in check, these are three things that we need to remember. The first is this, something insignificant has the potential to be the best piece on the board. Something insignificant has the potential to be the best piece on the board. This is a pawn. The pawn is the most insignificant piece on the chessboard. There are more pawns than any other piece on the board. In fact, there are as many pawns as every other piece on the board. Pawns can only move forward one space, unless it's the first move, then they can move two, which is weird. I don't understand that, but it's okay. They only attack, they can only move diagonally when they're attacking. They're the most insignificant piece on the board. But do you know there's something special about the pawn? See, in the game of chess, when the pawn reaches the other side of the board, Something special happens. In chess, it's called a promotion. A promotion. That pawn can then be traded in for any other piece on the board besides the king. Which means this. The pawn, the most insignificant, the weakest piece on the board can be traded in for the queen, which is the best, most important piece on the board. I think life is a lot like that. I think when we think we are insignificant, when we think that we don't matter, when we think that God would rather use somebody else, God says, I'm going to use you. I'm going to use you. Here's what the Apostle Paul says about it. Second Corinthians 12 verse 10. He says, 
That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, that's when I'm strong. The most insignificant piece on the board has the potential in the right hands, in the right position to be the most important piece on the board. So don't believe that you're too insignificant for God to use you. Because if you position yourself in the hands of the king, then he can promote you and you can be moved up to be the most important piece on the board. God can use you. God can use you. In your weaknesses, in your insecurities, in your inabilities, that's when God steps in. And that's when he uses you. Remember Moses? He's standing before the burning bush and God is calling him to to go to Pharaoh and speak. And Moses is like, speak, how can I speak? I can't speak, I can't do that. He says, God, let me bring my brother Aaron and let him speak for me. Let him do this. God allows it. So what is Moses saying? He's saying I'm insignificant. He's saying this is my weakness is this area of speaking. But did you know that as far as I know, as I've read through the book of Exodus, when Aaron and Moses are standing in the courtroom of Pharaoh, I only see Moses speaking. I don't see Aaron speaking up. Why? Because God can use that weakness, that perceived weakness. God can use the very thing that you're insecure about. And he can use it for his glory and for his purposes when you position yourself in the right place. Remember when you're concerned, when you feel hopeless, when you don't know what to do, when you're at your weakest and you feel like the enemy has you in a position of check, remember the most insignificant piece in the hands of God has the potential to be the strongest piece on the board. That's what we need to remember. The first thing is this. We need to remember that the most insignificant piece has the potential to be the best piece on the board. And the second is this. We need to remember when the enemy has us in check that there's no such thing as a perfect game. There's no such thing as a perfect game. In the game of chess, there's a German word for this, and I know I'm going to butcher it. I don't know how it's pronounced, but we're just going to go for it. It's Zugzwang. Zugzwang is this German word that they use in the game of chess. And what it means when literally translated into English, it means that there's a compulsion to move. It means that you have a compulsion to move when you're playing the game of chess. When you're sitting across an opponent and you're playing the game of chess, there's no such thing as a pass. You don't get to just say pass. When it looks like things are difficult, when you're in a difficult situation, when it looks like the only moves that you have are bad moves, when it looks like the only moves that you can make are you're going to lose a piece or you're going to set your opponent up in a better position, to attack you, you have a compulsion to move. It's called zugzwang. So it is in life. In life, when things get difficult, there is no pass. We can't just pass our turn. In life, we have a compulsion to move. Church, we have a compulsion to move forward. We have a compulsion to keep going. When things get difficult and opposition comes against us, We have a compulsion to keep moving forward in the presence of God, to keep going at the enemy, to keep taking ground for the kingdom, to say, I'm not giving up, I'm not passing, I'm not stopping. Things might look difficult now. Darkness comes in the night, but joy comes in the morning. Rejoicing comes in the morning. Church, did you know? Did you know that there has never been a night that's so dark That morning hasn't come. There's never been a night so dark, so black with darkness that it's kept the sun at bay. Morning always comes. Joy comes in the morning. We have a compulsion to move. We have a compulsion to keep going. And I don't know what you're going through. You might feel like the weight of the entire world is on your shoulders crushing you. And you walked into church today because you're saying, God, I don't know what's going on, but I need an answer. Let me tell you this. If that's what you're going through and you're dealing with right now, the king has one more move. 
The king has one more move. So don't stop. So don't give up. So keep going. Keep fighting. Keep praising. Keep believing. Keep running the race. Keep the faith. Keep looking up. Keep fixing your eyes on the author and the perfecter. Keep going in your situation, in your circumstance. Don't give up. Because in this world, you will have trouble. But Jesus said, take heart, I have overcome the world. How many of you know following Jesus doesn't mean life will be perfect? In fact, often the opposite is true. But why is it that as followers of Jesus, we say we want to follow in his footsteps, yet we're surprised by suffering that accompanies it? Did you know that following Jesus is a call to suffer for he suffered? Hundreds of years before Christ was born, Isaiah prophesied of his life, and he wrote these words. He said, he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering, familiar with pain. To follow Jesus is to be mocked, for he was mocked. To follow Jesus is to be betrayed, for he was betrayed. To follow Jesus is to be denied before men, because he was denied. To follow Jesus is a call to suffering. It's a call to daily pick up our cross and follow after him. So keep going. So don't lose heart. Don't lose the faith. Don't give up. Hold on in the midst of the suffering. And I know it's hard. I'm not saying it's easy to do this. But we have a compulsion to move. When the enemy has us in check, we must remember that the most insignificant piece has the potential to be the best piece on the board. We must remember that there's no such thing as a perfect game, that we have a compulsion to move. And thirdly, we must remember that as long as the king has one more move, the game isn't over. As long as the king has one more move, the game isn't over. When it seems like all hope is lost, if the king has just one more move... It's not over yet. It's not over. You're not defeated. You're not done because the king always has one more move. Three enemy armies tried to invade Judah and Jehoshaphat. And they didn't even need to pick up a sword to defeat them because the king had one more move. When it seems like it's over, the king had one more move. So it was with Jesus. The religious leaders, they despised Jesus. They were, in fact, jealous of him. They were jealous of his notoriety, jealous that he was, had this gathering of people because they believed that Jesus was creating an imbalance of power. They were the ones that were supposed to be looked up to. They were the ones who people were supposed to be following. But everybody's following this Jesus, so they're jealous. They're upset about it. They believed that because of this imbalance of power that was happening, they thought that the Romans would handle this imbalance of power as they handled everything else with the sword. This is why the high priest Caiaphas said to the rest of the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin, he said, John chapter 11, verse 50, you do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish. Why? Because he's saying that the Roman authorities, they're going to rise up and they're going to crush this thing. So we need to do something about it. And in that moment, the religious leaders devised the scheme and the plan. We got to get rid of this guy named Jesus. We got to get rid of him. They thought that if they could get rid of him, that his teachings would just go away. They thought that if they could get rid of him, that this movement that he has created would just dissipate and disappear. They were wrong. They were wrong. Jesus was betrayed by one of his own disciples. He was arrested. He was taken on trial. He was taken before judge and justice. He was taken all around. And, and then he came to the Roman governor named Pilate. The second time he was brought before Pilate in this whole sham of a trial. And Pilate was known as a cruel man. He was, he was used to just killing people. He was used to crucifixion. He was used to just slaying people in the streets. 
But even Pilate found no fault in Jesus. Even this Roman governor who was cruel found no fault in Jesus. But the religious leaders stirred up the crowd. They said, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said, what should I do with him? Crucify him. And Jesus was flogged and he was mocked and he was nailed to the cross. The Bible says that in his final hours, Jesus said this. He said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. When Jesus said that, those words, the religious leaders thought that was checkmate. They thought checkmate. We got this guy. It's over. It's done. Checkmate. But what they didn't realize, church, come on, what we know was that when Jesus said it is finished, he wasn't giving up. He wasn't conceding defeat. He was celebrating victory. When Jesus said it is finished, he meant checkmate. Checkmate to death. Checkmate to sin. Checkmate to the grave. Checkmate to what you're going through, the troubles, the difficulties of this life. Jesus said checkmate. Game over. It's done. Because three days later, the woman went to the tomb on a Sunday morning, and they found that the tomb was empty. Checkmate. Game over. He wins, church. The end of the story's already been written. He wins. So whatever you're going through, whatever difficulty you're facing, know this, he wins. In the end, he wins. See, Jesus knew he had to go to the cross. He knew he had to go to the cross. Why? Because of our sin, because of your sin and mine. What sin? Sin is this. Sin is any action or attitude that is contrary to the will and the word of God. The Bible says that we've all done it. That we've all committed this thing called sin. Actually, in the Greek, sin is an archery term. It means missing the target, missing the mark. And every single one of us has missed the mark. We've missed the target. We've all failed. We've all messed up. And I think that if you could just for a moment be honest with yourself, you could admit that, yeah, I'm not perfect and I've messed up. That I've had some actions, I've, I've, I've had some attitudes that were contrary to what I know to be true about God. The Bible says that we've all sinned. The Bible also teaches us that the wages of sin or the results of our sin is death. Is death. Death being eternal separation from God in a place called hell. I believe that heaven and hell are real places where real people are going. And that belief is what motivates me to tell you this this morning. To tell you that Jesus had to go on the cross because the Bible teaches that without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So Jesus knew that it was either your blood or his blood. And he said, let it be mine. And he took your place, not because you deserved it, not because you did anything to earn it. It was the exact opposite. It was because of his mercy, because of his grace, that he took your place. You and I deserve the cross. We deserve to be hanging there. We deserved separation from God. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why? Because 2 Corinthians tells us that he who was without sin became sin. He took it upon himself. He bore it in his body, in his flesh. He became sin. Why? So that you and I might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. A trade took place. Jesus said, my life for your life. My life for your life. And all you have to do is surrender to me. 
and you can be forgiven. You can be washed clean. My blood will cleanse you. And here's what happens. When you surrender to Jesus, that trade is complete. God no longer sees your sin anymore, but he sees Christ's righteousness on your life. When that trade happens, Jesus says, give me your sin. Give me your imperfections. Give me those actions, those attitudes, those thoughts. And I'll give you my perfection. You can have that this morning. Church, you can have that today. If you would, I'm going to invite Pam and the worship team, if you would come. This morning, if you're here, would you just bow your heads and close your eyes with me today? If you would say, Pastor James, I I know that I've sinned, but I... I've been deceiving myself. I've been thinking and believing that I am good enough. I've been thinking and believing that I don't need God. But this morning, maybe for the first time, or maybe you want to rededicate your life to Christ. You, Maybe you've done this before. It could be a hundred times, but you know you haven't been living right. You know you haven't been walking right, and you want to make that rededication before the Lord today. You want to surrender anew. If that would be you, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you to do anything weird. I just want to pray with you. So if that would be you this morning, would you just put your hand up right where it is and just slip it right back down? I see your hands. Yeah, I see them. I see them. Church, can we pray with those who raise their hands today? Can we not let anybody pray alone in this place? So just repeat these words after me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me by your blood. Make me new. Help me to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, can we celebrate? Can we celebrate? Can we give God glory? The word of God says that the angels in heaven celebrate when one comes to repentance. Celebrate today. Can we sing that song, There is a King Again? Can we do that? I just, I just feel that in my spirit. There is a king who has one more move, church. Pastor already talked about it during communion. He talked about it when he said, we're going to remember, we're going to take communion in remembrance of his death until he comes. <sighs> He's got one more move. He's got one more move. His next move, he's coming again. Did you know that we believe in the imminent return of Jesus Christ? And what that means is that we believe that there's no other prophecy that needs to be fulfilled except that he comes, that that trumpet is going to sound, that the heavens are going to be split open, that the dead in Christ will rise first, and we, the living, will be caught up with him in the air. And we, and at that moment, every tear will be wiped away. The pain and the sorrow of this earth cannot compare, the Apostle Paul says, it cannot compare to the glory that will be revealed in us. The king has one more move. His last move is he's coming. He's coming again. Give him glory. Give him praise. Can we celebrate that? He's coming. But in the meantime, we're here. We live as exiles in this world because this isn't our home. This isn't our home. This isn't our final destination. We're just passing through here. 
We're just passing through. Because we're just passing through, because we live as foreigners in a place that rejected our king, there's hardships, there's troubles, there's difficulties. And I don't wanna just move too quickly from this because I know that in this room there are people facing impossible odds. Facing a board that looks a lot like this. It's just, how could this be? So this morning, I wanna pray over you. If that's you and you would say, I'm just facing something that's just so difficult. That's just so painful. But I know I got to keep going. I know I got to keep moving, but I just need some prayer. Church, do we believe prayer works? Do we believe prayer works? Then if we believe prayer works, then it's not a weird thing to come around these altars and pray. The president of my college, he used to say this. He said, if we believe something happens when we pray, then we must also believe that something doesn't when we don't. Jesus said, ask and it you shall receive. You have not because you ask not. So this morning we're gonna ask. We're gonna ask that the king would move on our behalf with the knowledge the whole time that even if he doesn't take away the pain that we're currently going through, we can hold to the hope that one day he's coming again and all of that pain will go away. So church, if you could, everyone in this place, stand up with me this morning. And if you would say, I'm going through something difficult, I'm going through something hard, this seems impossible, and I'm not gonna leave without feeling and experiencing the presence of God because I need his presence to get me through another moment. If that would be you, then without hesitation, would you just step out from where you are and meet somebody up at these altars because we want to pray for you. Would you just come? Church, would you come? Would you come? Jesus. 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 You're worthy. You're holy. We're gonna sing and as we do I'm just gonna come and pray over you if that would be all right let's sing